Chapter Sixteen of A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen, wherein the Limberlost sings for Ammon and the talking trees tell great secrets. A few days later, Ammon handed Elnora a sheet of paper, and she read, "In your condition, I should think the moth hunting and life at the cabin would be very good for you. But for any sake, keep away from that grosbeak person, and don't come home with your head full of Granger ideas." No doubt he has a remarkable voice, but I can't bear untrained singers. And don't you get the idea that a June song is perennial? You are not hearing the music he will make when the four babies get the scarlet fever and the measles, and the catting wife leaves him at her home to care for them then. Poor soul, I pity her. How she exists where rampant cows bellow at you, frogs croak, mosquitoes consume you, the butter goes to oil in the summer and bricks in winter, while the pump freezes every day and there is no earthly amusement and no society. Poor things, can't you influence him to move? No wonder she gads when she has a chance. I should die. If you are thinking of settling in the country, think also of a woman who is satisfied with white and brown to accompany you. Brown of old deadly colors. I should go mad in brown. Elnora laughed as she read. Her face was dimpling as she handed back the sheet. Who's ahead? She asked. Who do you think? He parried. She is, said Elnora. Are you going to tell her in your next that R. B. Grosbeak is a bird and that he probably will spend the winter in a wild plum thicket in Tennessee? No, said Ammon. I shall tell her that I understand her ideas of life perfectly, and of course I never shall ask her to deal with oily butter and frozen pumps and measly babies, interpolated Elnora. Exactly, said Ammon. Just the same, I find so much to counterbalance those things that I should not object to bearing them myself, in view of the recompense. Where do we go and what do we do today? We will have to wander along the roads and around the edge of the Limberlost today, said Elnora. Mother is making strawberry preserves and she can't come until she finishes. Suppose we go down to the swamp and I'll show you what is left of the flower room that Terenzo Moore, the big lumberman of Great Rapids, made when he was a homeless boy here. Of course you have heard the story. Yes, and I've met the old Moores who are frequently in Chicago society. They have friends there. I think them one ideal couple. That sounds like they might be the only one or close to it, said Elnor, and indeed they are not. I know dozens. Aunt Margaret and Uncle Wesley are another, the Brown Lees another, and my mathematics professor and his wife. The world is full of happy people, but no one ever hears of them. You have to fight and make a scandal to get into the papers. No one knows about all the happy people. I am happy myself, and just look how perfectly inconspicuous I am. You only need go where you will be seen, began Ammon, when he remembered and finished. What do we take today? Ourselves, said Elnor. I have a vagabond streak in my blood, and it's in evidence. I'm going to show you where real flowers grow, real birds sing, and if I feel fright right about it, perhaps I shall raise a note or two myself. Oh, do you sing? asked Damon politely. At times, answered Elnor. As do the birds, because I must, but don't be scared. The mood does not possess me often. Perhaps I shan't raise a note when we get there. They went down the road to the swamp, climbed the snake fence, followed the path to the old trail, and then turned south along it. Elnora indicated to Ammon the trail with remnants of sagging barbed wire. It was ten years ago, she said. I was just a little schoolgirl, but I wandered widely even then, and no one cared. I saw him often. He had been in the city instruction all his life when he took the job of keeping timber thieves out of the swamp before many trees had been cut. It was strong man's work, and he was a frail boy, but he grew hardier as he lived out of doors. This trail we are on is the path his feet first wore in those days when he was insane with fear and eaten up with loneliness, but he stuck to his work and won out. I used to come down to the road and creep in among the bushes as far as I dared to watch him pass. He walked mostly. Sometimes he rode a wheel. Some days his face was dreadfully sad. Some days it was so determined a little child could see the force in it, and once it was radiant. That day the swamp angel was with him. I can't tell you what she was like. I never saw anyone who resembled her. He stopped near her to show her a bird's nest. Then they went on to a sort of flower room he had made, and he sang for her. By the time he left, I had gotten bold enough to come out on the trail, and I met the big Scotchman Freckles lived with. He saw me catching moths and butterflies, so he took me to the flower room and gave me everything there. I don't dare come alone often, so I can't keep it up as he did, but you can see something of how it was. Elnora led the way and Ammon followed. The outlines of the room were not distinct because many of the trees were gone, but Elnora showed how it had been as nearly as she could. 
The swamp is almost ruined now, she said. The maples, walnuts, and cherries are all gone. The talking trees are the only things left worth while. The talking trees? I don't understand, commented Ammon. No wonder, laughed Elnor. They are my discovery. You know, all trees whisper and talk during the summer, but there are two that have so much to say they keep on the whole winter when the others are silent. The beeches and oaks so love to talk they cling to their dead, dry leaves. In the winter the winds are stiffest and blow most, so these trees whisper, chatter, sob, laugh, and at times roar until the sound is deafening. They never cease until new leaves come out in the spring to push off the old ones. I love to stand beneath them with my ear to the great trunks, interpreting what they say to fit my moods. The beeches branch low and their leaves are small, so they only know common earthly things. But the oaks run straight above almost all other trees before they branch. Their arms are mighty, their leaves large. They meet the winds that travel around the globe and from them learn the big things. Ammon studied the girl's face. What do the beeches tell you, Elnor? he asked gently. To be patient, to be unselfish, to do unto others as I would have them do to me. And the oaks? They say, be true, live a clean life. Send your soul up here and let the winds of the world teach you what honor achieves. Wonderful secrets, those, marveled Ammon. Are they telling them now? Could I hear? No, they are only gossiping now. This is playtime. They tell the big secrets to a white world when the music inspires them. The music? All of the trees are harps in the winter. Their trunks are the frames, their branches the strings, the winds the musicians. When the air is cold and clear, the world very white and the harp music swelling. Then the talking trees tell the strengthening, uplifting things. You wonderful girl, cried Ammon. What a woman you will be. If I am a woman at all worth while, it will be because I have had such wonderful opportunities, said Elnor. Not every girl is driven to the forest to learn what God has to say there. Here are the remains of Freckles' room. The time the angel came here, he sang to her, and I listened. I never heard music like that. No wonder she loved him. Everyone who knew him did, and they do yet. Try that log. It makes a fairly good seat. This old store box was this treasure house, just as it's now mine. I will show you my dearest possession. I do not dare take it home because Mother can't overcome her dislike for it. It was my father's, and in some ways I am like him. This is the strongest. Elnora lifted the violin and began to play. She wore a school dress of green gingham, with the sleeves rolled to the elbows. She seemed to part the setting all around her. Her head shone like a small dark sun, and her face never had seemed so rose-fleshed and fair. From the instant she drew the bow, her lips parted, and her eyes fastened on something far away in the swamp, and never did she give more of that impression of feeling for her notes and repeating something audible only to her. Ammon was too near to get the best effect. He arose and stepped back several yards, leaning against a large tree, looking and listening with all his soul. As he changed position, he saw that Mrs. Comstock had followed them, and was standing on the trail, where she could not have helped hearing everything Elnora had said. So to Ammon before her, and the mother watching on the trail, Elnora played the song of the Limberlost. It seemed as if the swamp hushed all its other voices, and spoke only through her dancing bow. The mother out on the trail and heard it all once before from the girl, many times from her father. To the man it was a revelation. He stood so stunned he forgot Mrs. Comstock. He tried to realize what a great city audience would say to that music from such a player with a like background, and he could not imagine. He was wondering what he dared say, how much he might express, when the last note fell and the girl laid the violin in the case, closed the door, locked it, and hid the key in the rotting wood at the end of a log. Then she came to him. Ammon stood looking at her curiously. "'I wonder,' he said, "'what people would say to that.' I did it in public once, said Elnor. I think they liked it fairly well. I had a note yesterday offering me the leadership of the high school orchestra in Onabasha. I can take it as well as not. None of my talks to the grades come the first thing in the morning. I can play a few minutes in the orchestra and reach the rooms in plenty of time. It will be more work than I love and like finding the money. I would gladly pay for nothing just to be able to express myself. With some people it makes a regular battlefield of the human heart. The struggle for self-expression, said Eamon. You are going to do beautiful work in the world and do it well. When I realized that your violin belonged to your father, that he played it before you were born, and it no doubt affected your mother strongly, and then coupled with that the years you have roamed these fields and swamps finding in nature all you had to lavish your great heart upon, I can see how you evolved. I understand what you mean by self-expression. I know something of what you have to express. 
The world never so wanted your message as it does now. It is hungry for the things you know. I can see easily how your position came to you. What you have to give is taught in no college. I'm not sure, but you would spoil yourself if you try to run your mind through a set groove with hundreds of others. I never thought I should say such a thing to anyone, but I do say to you, and I honestly believe it. Give up the college idea. Your mind does not need that sort of development. It is far past it. Stick close to your work in the woods. You are getting so infinitely greater on it than the best college student I ever knew, that there is no comparison. When you have money to spend, take that violin and go to one of the world's greatest masters and let the Limberloss sing to him. If he thinks you can improve it, very well. I have my doubts. Do you really mean that you would give up all idea of going to college if you were me? I really mean it, said Ammon. If I now held the money to send you in my hands and could give it to you in some way you would accept, I would tear it up and throw it away first. I do not know why it is the lot of the world always to want something different from what life gives them. If you only could realize it, my girl, you are in college and have been always. You are in the school of experience, and has taught you to think and given you a heart. God knows I envy the man who wins it. You have been in the college of the Limberlost all your life, and I never met a graduate from any other institution who could begin to compare with you in sanity, clarity, and interesting knowledge. I wouldn't even advise you to read too many books on your lines. You get your stuff firsthand, and you know that you are right. What you should do is to begin early to practice self-expression. Don't wait too long to tell us about the woods as you know them. Follow the course of the bird woman, you mean, asked Elnor. In your own way, with your own light, she won't live forever. You are younger, and you will be ready to begin where she ends. The swamp has given you all you need so far. Now you give it to the world in payment. College be confounded. Go to work and show people what there is in you. Not until then did he remember that Mrs. Comstock was somewhere very near. Should we go out to the trail and see if your mother is coming? he asked. Here she is now, said Elnor. Gracious, it's a mercy I got that violin put away in time. I didn't expect you so soon, whispered the girl as she turned and went toward her mother. Mrs. Comstock's face was as steady as she looked at Elnor. I forgot that you were making some preserves and they didn't require much cooking, she said. We should have waited for you. Not at all, answered Mrs. Comstock. Have you found anything yet? Nothing that I can show you, said Elnor. I am not sure, but I found an idea that will revolutionize the whole course of my work, thought, and ambitions. Ambitions! My, what a hefty word, laughed Mrs. Comstock. Now who would suspect a little red-haired country girl of harboring such a deadly germ in her body? Can you tell Mother about it? Not if you talk to me that way, I can't, said Elnor. Well, I guess we better let ambition lie. I've always heard it was safest to sleep. If you ever get a bona fide attack, it will be time to attend it. Let's hunt specimens. It is June. Philip and I are in the grades. You have an hour to put an idea into our heads that will stick for a lifetime and grow for good. That's the way I look at your job. Now, what are you going to give us? We don't want any old silly stuff that has been hashed over and over. We want a big new idea to plant in our hearts. Come on, Miss Teacher, what is the boiled down, double distilled essence of June? Give it to us strong. We are large enough to furnish it developing ground. Hurry up. Time is short and we are waiting. What is the miracle of June? What one thing epitomizes the whole month and makes it just a little different from any other? The birth of these big night moths, said Elnor promptly. Ammon clapped his hands. The tears started into Mrs. Comstock's eyes. She took Elnor in her arms and kissed her forehead. You'll do, she said. June is June, not because it has bloom, bird, fruit, or flower exclusive to it alone. It's half May and half July in all of them. But as I figure it, it's just June when it comes to these great velvet-winged night moths which sweep its moonlit skies, consummating their scheme of creation and dropping like a bloomed-out flower. Give them moths for June. Then make that the basis of your year's work. Find the distinctive feature of each month, the one thing which marks it a time apart, and hit them squarely between the eyes with it. Even the babies of the lowest grades can comprehend moths when they see a few emerge and learn their history, as it can be lived before them. You should show your specimens in pairs, then their eggs, the growing caterpillars, and then the cocoons. You want to dig out the red heart of every month in the year and hold it pulsing before them. I can't name all of them offhand, but I think of one more right now. February belongs to our winter birds. It is then the great horned owl, the swamp courts his mate, the big hawk's pair, and even the crows begin to take note of this. These are truly our birds. Like the poor, we have them always with us. You should hear the musicians of the swamp in February, Philip, on a mellow night. Oh, but they are in earnest. For twenty-one years I've listened by night to the great owls. 
all the smaller sizes, the foxes, coons, and every resident left in these woods, and by day to the hawks, yellow hammers, sap suckers, tent mice, crows, and all our winter birds. Only just now it's come to me that the distinctive feature of February is not linen bleaching nor sugar making, it's the love month of our very own birds. Give them hawks and owls for February, Elnora. The girl looked at Ammon with flashing eyes. "'How's that?' she said. "'Don't you think I will make it with such help? "'You should hear the concert she is talking about. "'It is simply indescribable when the ground is covered with snow and the moonlight white.' "'It's about the best music we have,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I just wonder if you couldn't copy that alone "'and make a strong original piece out of it for your violin, Elnora.' "'There was one tense breath, and "'I could try,' said Elnora simply. "'Ammon rushed to the rescue.' We must go to work, he said, and began examining a walnut branch for luna moth eggs. Elnora joined him while Mrs. Comstock drew her embroidery from her pocket and sat on the log. She said she was tired. They could come for her when they were ready to go. She could hear their voices all around her until she called them at supper time. When they came to her, she stood waiting on the trail, the sewing in one hand, the violin in the other. Elnora became very white, but took the trail without a word. Ammon, unable to see a woman carry a heavier load than he, reached for the instrument. Mrs. Comstock shook her head. She carried the violin home, took it into her room, and closed the door. Elnor turned to Ammon. "'If she destroys that, I will die!' cried the girl. "'She won't,' said Ammon. "'You misunderstand her. She wouldn't have said what she did about the owls if she had meant to. She is your mother. No one loves you as she does. Trust her. Myself, I think she's simply great.' Mrs. Comstock returned with serene face and all of them helped with the supper. When it was over, Ammon and Elnor sorted and classified the afternoon specimens and made a trip to the woods to paint and light several trees for moths. When they came back, Mrs. Comstock sat in the arbor and they joined her. The moonlight was so intense, print could have been read by it. The damp night air held odors near to earth, making flower and tree perfume strong. A thousand insects were serenading, and in the maple the grosbeak occasionally sent a reassuring word to his wife, while she answered that all was well. A whippoorwill wailed in the swamp, and back by the blue-bordered pool, a chat complained disconsolately. Mrs. Comstock went into the cabin, but she returned almost instantly, laying the violin and bow across Elnora's lap. "'I wish you would give us a little music,' she said. End of chapter 16《ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・ストラン・ポーター・ジーン・When he neared the Comstock cabin, he left the warm dust of the highway and stepped softly at slower pace over the rank grasses by the roadside. He had heard aright. The violin was in the grape arbor, singing like mad, singing a perfect jumble of everything poured out in an exultant tumult. The strings were voicing the joy of a happy girl heart. Billy climbed the fence enclosing the west woods and crept down toward the arbor. He was not a spy and not a sneak. He merely wanted to satisfy his child heart as to whether Mrs. Comstock was at home, and Elnora at last playing her loved violin with her mother's consent. One peep sufficed. Mrs. Comstock sat in the moonlight, her head leaning against the arbor. On her face was a look of perfect peace and contentment. As he stared at her, the bow hesitated a second, and Mrs. Comstock spoke. "'That's all very melodious and sweet,' she said, "'but I do wish you could play Money Musk and some of the tunes I danced as a girl.' Elnora had been avoiding carefully every note that might be reminiscent of her father. At the word, she laughed softly and struck into turkey in the straw. An instant later, Mrs. Comstock was dancing like mad in the moonlight. Ammon sprang to her side, caught her in his arms, while to Elnora's laughter and the violin's impetuous, they danced until they dropped panting on the arbor bench. Billy scarcely knew when he got back on the road. His light feet barely touched the soft way, so swiftly he flew. He vaulted the fence and burst into the house. "'Aunt Margaret! Uncle Wesley!' he screamed. "'Listen, listen, she's playing it. Elnora's playing her violin at home, and Aunt Kate is dancing like anything before the arbor. I saw her in the moonlight. I ran down. Oh, Aunt Margaret!' Billy fled to his haven and sobbed on Margaret's breast. 
"Why, Billy," she chided, "don't cry, you little dunce! That's what we've all prayed for these many years, but you must be mistaken about Kate. I can't believe it." Billy lifted his head. "Well, you just have to," he said. "When I say I saw anything, Uncle Wesley knows I did. The city man was dancing with her. They danced together and Elnora laughed. But it didn't look funny to me. I was scared." "'Who was it said wonders would never cease?' asked Wesley. "'You mark my word. Once you get Kate Comstock started, you can't stop her. There's a wagon load of pinned-up force in her, dancing in the moonlight. Well, I'll be hanged.' Billy was at his side instantly. "'Well, whoever does it will have to hang me, too,' he cried. Then Tim threw his arm around Billy and drew him close. "'Tell us all about it, son,' he said. Billy told. "'And when Elnora just stopped a breath, can't you play some of the old things I knew when I was a girl?' said her ma. Then Elnora began to do a thing that made you want to whirl round and round and quicker and scat. There was her ma whirling. The city man, he ups and grabs her and whirls too, and back in the woods I was going just like they did. Elnora begins to laugh, and I ran to tell you because I knew you'd like to know. Now all the world is right, ain't it? Ended Billy as he leaned against Sinton in supreme satisfaction. You just bet it is, said Wesley. Billy looked steadily at Margaret. Is it Aunt Margaret? Margaret Sinton smiled at him bravely. An hour later, when Billy was ready to climb the stairs to his room, he went to Margaret to say good night. He leaned against her an instant and brought his lips close to her ear. "'Wish I could get your little girls back for you,' he whispered, and dashed for the stairs. Down at the Comstock cabin, the violin played on until Nora was so tired she scarcely could lift the bow. Then Ammon went home. The women walked to the gate with him and stood watching him from sight. "'That's what I call one decent young man,' said Mrs. Comstock. To see him fit in with us, you'd think he'd been raised in the cabin, but it's likely he's always had the very cream of the pot. Yes, I think so, laughed Elnora, but it hasn't hurt him. I've never seen anything I could criticize. He's teaching me so much, unconsciously. You know he graduated from Harvard and has several degrees in law. He's coming in the morning, and we are going to put in a big day on Catechalee. Which is? Those gray moths with wings that fold back like big flies, and they appear as if they had been carved from old wood. Then, when they fly, the lower wings flash out, and they are red and black, or gold and black, or pink and black, or dozens of bright, beautiful colors combined with black. No one ever has classified all of them and written their complete history, unless the bird woman is doing it now. She wants everything she can get about them. I remember, said Mrs. Comstock, they are mighty pretty things. I've started up slews of them from the vines covering the logs all my life. I must be cautious and catch them after this, but they seem powerful spry. I might get hold of something rare. She thought intently and added, "'And wouldn't know it if I did. It would just be my luck. I've had the rarest thing on earth and reached this many a day and only had the wit to cinch it just as it was going. I'll bet I don't let anything else escape me.' Next morning, Ammon came early, and he and Elnora went at once to the fields and woods. Mrs. Comstock had come to believe so implicitly in him that she now stayed at home to complete the work before she joined them, and when she did, she often sat sewing, leaving them wandering hours at a time. It was noon before she finished, and then she packed a basket of lunch. She found Elnora and Philip near the violet patch, which was still in its prime. They all lunched together in the shade of a wild crab thicket, with flowers spread at their feet and the gold orioles streaking the air with flashes of light and trailing ecstasy behind them, while the red wings, as always, asked the most impertinent questions. Then Mrs. Comstock carried the basket back to the cabin, and Ammon and Elnora sat on the log, resting a few minutes. They had unexpected luck, and both were eager to continue the search. "'Do you remember your promise about these violets?' asked Ammon. "'Tomorrow's Edith's birthday, and if I'd put them special delivery on the morning train, she'd get them in the late afternoon. They ought to keep well that long. She leaves for the north next day.' "'Of course you can have them,' said Elnora. "'We will quit long enough before supper to gather a great bunch. They can be packed so they will carry all right.' They should be perfectly fresh, especially if we gather them this evening and let them drink all night." Then they went back to hunt Katakali. It was a long and a happy search. It led them into new, unexplored nooks of the woods by a red pole nest, and where goldfinches prospected for thistle-down for the cradles they would line a little later. It led them into real forest, where deep, dark pools lay, where the hermit thrush and the wood robin extracted the essence from all of their bird melody, and poured it out in their pure bell-toned notes. It seemed as if every old gray tree trunk, slab of loose bark, and prostrate log yielded the flashing gray treasures, while of all others they seemed to take alarm most easily and be most difficult to capture. Ammon came to Elnora at dusk, 
daintily holding one by the body, its dark wings showing and its long slender legs trying to clasp his fingers and creep from his hold. "'Oh, for mercy's sake!' cried Elnor and stared at him. "'I half believe it,' exulted Ammon. "'Did you ever see one? Only in collections and mighty seldom there.' Elnor studied the black wings intently. "'I surely believe that Sappho,' she marveled. "'The bird woman will be overjoyed.' "'We must get the cyanide jar quickly,' said Ammon. "'I won't lose her for a hundred dollars. "'Such a chase as she led me.' "'Elnora got the jar and began gathering up paraphernalia. "'When you make a find like that,' she said, "'it's the right time to quit and feel glorious all the rest of that day. "'I tell you I'm proud. "'We will go now. "'We have barely time to carry out our plans before supper. "'Won't Mother be pleased to see that we have a rare one?' "'I'd like to see any one more pleased than I am,' said Philip Ammon. "'I feel as if I'd earned my supper tonight. "'Let's go.' He took the greater part of the load and stepped aside for Elnora to precede him. She went down the path, broken by the grazing cattle, toward the cabin, and nearest the violet patch she stopped, laid down her net and the thing she carried. Ammon passed her and hurried straight toward the back gate. "'Aren't you going to?' began Elnora. "'I'm going to get this moth home in a hurry,' he said. "'The cyanide has lost its strength and it's not working well. We need some fresh in the jar.' He had forgotten the violets. Elnora stood looking after him, a curious expression on her face. One second so. Then she picked up the net and followed. At the blue-bordered pool she paused and half turned back, then she closed her lips firmly and went on. It was nine o'clock when Ammon said good-bye and started to town. His gay whistle floated to them from the farthest corner of the Limberlost. Elnora complained of being tired, so she went to her room and to bed. But sleep would not come. Thought was racing in her brain, and the longer she lay, the wider awake she grew. At last, she softly slipped from bed, lighted her lamp, and began opening boxes. Then she went to work. Two hours later, a beautiful birch bark basket, strongly and artistically made, stood on her table. She set a tiny alarm clock at three, returned to bed, and fell asleep instantly with a smile on her lips. She was on the floor with the first tinkle of the alarm, and hastily dressing, she picked up the basket and a box to fit it, crept down the stairs, and out to the violet patch. She was unafraid as it was so near morning, and lining the basket with damp mosses, she swiftly began picking with practiced hands the youngest of the flowers. It was so dark she scarcely could tell which were freshest at times, but day soon came creeping over the limberlost and peeped down at her. The robins awoke all their neighbors, and a babble of bird notes filled the air. The dew was dripping, and the first strong rays of light fell on a world in which Elnora worshipped. When the basket was filled to overflowing, she set it in the stout pasteboard box, packed it solid with mosses, tied it firmly, and slipped under the cord a note she had written the previous night. Then she took a short cut across the woods and walked swiftly to Onabasha. It was after six o'clock, but all of the city she wished to avoid were asleep. She had no trouble in finding a small boy out, and she stood at a distance waiting while he rang Dr. Ammon's bell and delivered the package for Philip to a maid, with a note which was to be given him at once. On the way home through the woods, passing some baited trees, she collected the captive moths. She entered the kitchen with them so naturally that Mrs. Comstock made no comment. After breakfast, Elnora went to her room, cleared away all trace of the night's work, and was out in the arbor mounting moths when Ammon came down the road. "'I'm tired sitting,' she said to her mother. "'I think I will walk a few rods and meet him.' "'Who's a trump?' called Ammon from afar. <laughs> "'Well, not you,' retorted Elnora. "'Confess that you forgot.' completely said ammon but luckily it would not have been fatal i wrote polly last week to send either something appropriate and handsome today with my card but that touch from the woods will be mighty effective thank you more than i can say aunt anna and i unpacked it to see the basket and it was a beauty she says you're always doing things like that well i hope not laughed elnora if you'd seen me sneaking out before dawn not to waken mother and coming in with moss to make her think i'd been to the trees you'd know it was a most special occasion then Ammon understood two things. Elnora's mother did not know of the early morning trip to the city, and the girl had come to meet him to tell him so. "'You were a brick to do it,' he whispered as he closed the gate behind them. "'I'll never forget you for it. Thank you ever so much. You are too kind to me.' "'I did not do that for you,' said Elnora tersely. "'I did it mostly to preserve my own self-respect. I saw you were forgetting. If I did it for anything besides that, I did it for her.' "'Just look what I've brought,' said Ammon, entering the arbor and greeting Mrs. Comstock. "'Borrowed it of the bird woman, and it isn't hers. A rare edition of Catocaly with colored plates. I told her the best I could, and she said to try for Sappho here. I suspect the bird woman will be out presently. She was all excitement.' Then they bent over the book together, and with the mountain moth before them, determined her family. 
The bird woman did come later, and carried the moth away to put into a book, and Elnora and Ammon were freshly filled with enthusiasm. So these days were the beginning of the weeks that followed, six of them flying on time's wings, each filled to the brim with interest. After June, the moth hunts grew less frequent, the fields and woods were scoured for material for Elnora's grade work, the most absorbing occupation they found was in carrying out Mrs. Comstock's suggestion to learn the vital thing for which each month was distinctive, and make that the key to the nature work. They wrote out a list of the months, opposite each of the things all of them could suggest which seemed to pertain to that month alone, and then tried to sift until they found something typical. Mrs. Comstock was a great help. Her mother had been Dutch and had brought from Holland numerous quaint sayings and superstitions easily traceable to Pliny's natural history, and in Mrs. Comstock's early years in Ohio she had heard much Indian talk among her elders, so she knew the signs of each season, and sometimes they helped. Always her practical thought and sterling common sense were useful. When they were afield until exhausted, they came back to the cabin for food, to prepare specimens and classify them, and to talk over the day. Sometimes Ammon brought books and read while Elnor and her mother worked, and every night Mrs. Comstock asked for the violin. Her perfect hunger for music was sufficient evidence of how she had suffered without it. So the days crept by, golden, filled with useful work and pure pleasure. The grosbeak had led the family in the maple abroad in a second brood, and a wild grapevine clambering over the well was almost ready for flight. The dust lay thick on the country roads, the days grew warmer, summer was just posing to slip into fall, and Ammon stayed on, coming each day as if he had belonged there always, and expected to remain forever. One warm August afternoon, Mrs. Comstock looked up from the ruffle on which she was engaged to see a blue-coated messenger enter the gate. "'Is Philip Ammon here?' asked the boy. "'He is,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I have a message for him. He is in the woods back of the cabin. I will ring the bell, and he will come. Do you know if it is important?' "'Urgent,' said the boy. "'I rode hard.' Mrs. Comstock stepped to the back door and clanged the dinner bell sharply, paused a second, and rang again. In a short time, Ammon and Elnora came down the path on the run. "'Are you ill, mother?' cried Elnora. Mrs. Comstock indicated the boy. "'There is an important message for Philip,' she said. Ammon muttered an excuse and tore open the telegram. His color faded slightly. "'I have to take the first train,' he said. "'My father is ill, and I am needed.' He handed the sheet to Elnora. I have about two hours, as I remember the trains north, but my things are all over Uncle Doc's house, so I must go at once. Certainly, said Elnora, giving back the message. Is there anything I can do to help? Mother, get Philip a glass of buttermilk to start on. I will gather what you have here. Never mind, there is nothing of importance. I don't want to be hampered. I'll send for it if I miss anything I need. Ammon drank the milk, said goodbye to Mrs. Comstock, repeatedly thanked her for all her kindness, and turned to Elnora. "'Will you walk to the edge of the Limberloss with me?' he asked. Elnora assented. Mrs. Comstock followed to the gate, urged him to come again soon, and repeated her good-bye. Then she went back to the arbor to await Elnora's return. As she watched down the road, she smiled softly. "'I had an idea he would speak to me first, she thought. "'But this may change things some. He hasn't time. Elnora will come back a happy girl, and she has good reason. He is a model young man. Her lot will be mighty different from mine.' She picked up her embroidery and began setting dainty, precise little stitches, possible only to certain women. On the road, Elnora spoke first. "'I do hope it is nothing serious,' she said. "'Is he usually strong?' "'Quite strong,' said Philip. "'I'm not at all alarmed, but I'm very much ashamed. I've been well enough for the last month to have gone home and helped him with some critical cases that were keeping him at work in this heat. I was enjoying myself, so I wouldn't offer to go, and he would not ask me to come so long as he could help it.' I have allowed him to overtax himself until he is down, and Mother and Polly are north at our cottage. He's never been sick before, and it's probable I am to blame that he is now. He intended you to stay this long when you came, urged Elnora. Yes, but it's hot in Chicago. I should have remembered him. He is always thinking of me. Possibly he has needed me for days. I'm ashamed to go to him in splendid condition, and admit that I was having such a fine time I forgot to come home. You have had a fine time, then, asked Elnora. They had reached the fence. Ammon vaulted over to take a short cut across the fields. He turned and looked at her. "'The best, the sweetest, and most wholesome time any man ever had in this world,' he said. "'Oh, Nora, if I talked hours, I couldn't make you understand what a girl I think you are. I never in all my life hated anything as I hate leaving you. It seems to me that I have not strength to do it.' "'If you have gotten anything worth while from me,' said Elnora, "'that should be it. 
just to have strength to go to your duty and to go quickly. Ammon caught the hand she held out to him in both his. Oh, Nora, these days we have had together, have they been sweet to you? Beautiful days, said Elnora, each like a perfect dream to be thought over and over all my life. Oh, they have been the only really happy days I've ever known. These days rich with mother's love and doing useful work with your help. Goodbye, you must hurry. Ammon gazed at her. He tried to drop her hand and only clutch it closer. Suddenly he drew her toward him. Elnora, he whispered, will you kiss me goodbye? Elnora drew back and stared at him with wide eyes. I'd strike you sooner, she said. Have I ever said or done anything in your presence that made you feel free to ask that, Philip Ammon? No, panted Ammon. No, I think so much of you I just wanted to touch your lips once before I left you. You know, Elnora. Don't distress yourself, said Elnora calmly. I'm broad enough to judge you sanely. I know what you mean. It would be no harm to you. It would not matter to me, but here we will think of someone else. Edith Carr would not want your lips tomorrow. She knew they had touched mine today. I was wise to say, go quickly. Ammon still clung to her. Will you write me? he begged. No, said Elnora. There is nothing to say save goodbye. We can do that now. Ammon held on. Promise that you will write me only one letter, he urged. I want just one message from you to lock in my desk and keep always. Promise you will write once, Elnora. Elnora looked straight into his eyes and smiled serenely. If the talking trees tell me this winter the secret of how a man may grow perfect, I will write you what it is, Philip. In all the time I have known you, I never have liked you so little. Goodbye. She drew away her hand and swiftly turned back to the road. Philip Ammon, wordless, started toward Onabasha on a run. Elnora crossed the road, climbed the fence, and sought the shelter of their own woods. She took a diagonal course and followed it until she came to the path leading past the violet patch. She went down this hurriedly. Her hands were clenched at her sides, her eyes dry and bright, her cheeks red flush and her breath coming fast. When she reached the patch, she turned into it and stood looking around her. The mosses were dry, the flowers gone, weeds a foot high covered it. She turned away and went on down the path until she was almost in sight of the cabin. Mrs. Comstock smiled and waited in the arbor until it dawned on her that Elnora was a long time coming, so she went to the gate. The road stretched away toward the Limberlost, empty and lonely. Then she knew that Elnora had gone into their own woods and would come in the back way. She could not understand why the girl did not hurry to her with what she would have to tell. She went out and wandered around the garden. Then she stepped into the path and started back along the way leading to the woods, past the pool now framed in a thick setting of yellow lilies. Then she saw and stopped, gasping for breath. Her hands flew up and her lined face grew ghastly. She stared at the sky and then at the prostrate girl figure. Over and over she tried to speak, but only a dry breath came. She turned and fled back to the garden. In the familiar enclosure she gazed around her like a caged animal seeking escape. The sun beat down on her bare head mercilessly, and mechanically she moved over to the shade of a half-grown hickory tree that voluntarily had sprouted by the milk house. At her feet lay an axe with which she made kindlings for fires. She stooped and picked it up. That prone figure sobbing in the grass caught her with a renewed spasm. She shut her eyes as if to close it out. That made hearing so acute she felt certain she heard Elnora moaning by the path. The eyes flew open. They fell squarely on a few spindling tomato plants set too near the tree and stunted by its shade. Mrs. Comstock whirled on the hickory and swung the axe. Her hair shook down. Her clothing became disarranged. In the heat, the perspiration streamed, but stroke fell on stroke until the tree crashed over, grazing a corner of the milk house and smashing the garden fence on the east. At the sound, Elnora sprang to her feet and came running down the garden walk. "'Mother!' she cried. "'Mother, what in the world are you doing?' Mrs. Comstock wiped her ghastly face on her apron. "'I've laid out to cut that tree for years,' she said. "'His shades the beets in the morning and the tomatoes in the afternoon.' Elnora uttered one wild little cry and fled into her mother's arms. "'Oh, mother,' she sobbed, "'will you ever forgive me?' Mrs. Comstock's arms swept together in a tight grip around Elnora. "'There isn't a thing on God's footstool from A to Izzard I won't forgive you, my precious girl,' she said. "'Tell mother what it is.' Elnora lifted her wet face. "'He told me,' she panted, "'just as soon as he decently could. "'That second day he told me. "'Almost all his life he's been engaged to a girl at home. "'He never cared anything about me. "'He was just interested in the moths and growing strong.' "'Mrs. Comstock's arms tightened. "'With a shaking hand she stroked the bright hair. 
tell me, honey," she said. "Is he to blame for a single one of these tears?" "Not one," sobbed Aunt Ollie. "Oh, Mother, I won't forgive you if you don't believe that! Not one! He never said, or looked, or did anything all the world might not have known. He likes me very much as a friend. He hated to go dreadfully." "Oh, Nora!" The mother's head bent until the white hair mingled with the brown. "Oh, Nora, why didn't you tell me at first?" Aunt Nora caught her breath in a sharp snatch. "I know I should," she sobbed. "I will bear any punishment for not, but I didn't feel as if I possibly could. I was afraid." "Afraid of what?" The shaking hand was on the hair again. "Afraid you wouldn't let him come," panted Aunt Nora. "And oh, Mother, I wanted him so." End of Chapter Seventeen. Chapter Eighteen of A Girl the Limber Lost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen, wherein Mrs. Comstock experiments with rejuvenation, and Elnora teaches natural history. For the next week, Mrs. Comstock and Elnora worked so hard there was no time to talk, and they were compelled to sleep from physical exhaustion. Neither of them made any pretense of eating, for they could not swallow without a great effort. So they drank milk and worked. Elnora went on setting bait for Catechalee and Sphingine, which, unlike the big moths of June, lived several months. She took all the dragonflies and butterflies she could, and when she went over the list for the man of India, she found, to her amazement, that with Ammon's help she once more had it complete, save a pair of yellow emperors. The circumstance was so amazing she had a fleeting thought of writing Ammon and asking him to see if he could not secure her a pair. She did tell the bird woman, and from every source at her command, she tried to complete the series with these moths and could not find any for sale. I think the mills of the gods are grinding this grist," said Elnora, "and we might as well wait patiently until they choose to send a yellow emperor." Mrs. Comstock invented work. When she had nothing more to do, she hoed in the garden. Although the earth was hard and dry, and there were no plants that really needed attention, then came a notification that Elnora would be compelled to attend a week session of the Teachers Institute held at the county seat, twenty miles north of Onabasha, the following week. That gave them something of which to think and real work to do. Elnora was requested to bring her violin. As she was on the program of one of the most important sessions for a talk on nature work in grade schools, she was driven to prepare her speech and to select and practice some music. Her mother turned her attention to clothing. They went to Onabasha together and purchased a simple and appropriate fall suit and hat, goods for a dainty little colored frock, and a dress skirt and several fancy waists. Margaret Senton came down and the sewing began. When everything was finished and packed. Elnora kissed her mother goodbye at the depot, and the train pulled out. Mrs. Comstock went into the waiting room and dropped into a seat to rest. Her heart was so sore, her whole right side felt tender. She was half starved for the food she had no appetite to take. She worked in dogged determination till she was exhausted. For a time, she simply sat and rested. Then she began to think. She was glad Elnora had gone, where she would be compelled to fix her mind on other things for a few days. She remembered the girl had said she wanted to go. School would begin the following week. She thought over what Elnora would have to do to accomplish her work successfully. She would be compelled to arise at six o'clock, walk three miles through varying weather, lead the high school orchestra, and then put in the rest of the day traveling from building to building over the city, teaching a specified length of time every week in each room. She must have her object lessons ready, and she must do a certain amount of practicing with the orchestra. Then a cold lunch at noon and a three-mile walk at night. Humph," said Mrs. Comstock. "To get through that, the girl would have to be made of cast iron. I wonder how I can help her best." She plunged in deepest thought again. "The less she sees of what she's been having all summer, the sooner she'll feel better about it," she muttered. She arose, went to the bank, and inquired for the cashier. "I want to know just how I'm fixed here," she said. The cashier laughed. Well, you haven't been in a hurry," he replied. "We have been ready for you any time these twenty years, but you didn't seem to pay much attention. Your account is rather flourishing. Interest, when it gets to compounding, is quite a money breeder. Come back here to a table, and I will show you your balances." Mrs. Comstock sank into a chair and waited while the cashier read a jumble of figures to her. It meant that her deposits had exceeded her expenses from one to three hundred dollars a year, according to the cattle, sheep. 
hogs, poultry, butter, and eggs she had sold. The aggregate of these sums had been compounding interest throughout the years. Mrs. Comstock stared at the total with dazed and unbelieving eyes. Through her sick heart rushed the realization that if she merely had stood before that wicket and asked one question, she would have known that all those bitter years of skimping for Elnora and herself had been unnecessary. She arose and went back to the depot. "'I want to send a message,' she said. She picked up the pencil and, with rash extravagance, wrote, "'Found money at bank didn't know about. If you want to go to college, come on first train and get ready.' She hesitated a second, and then she said to herself grimly, "'Yes, I'll pay for that too,' and recklessly added, "'With love, mother.' Then she sat waiting for the answer. It came in less than an hour. "'Going to teach this winter, with dearest love, Elnora.' Mrs. Comstock held the message a long time. When she arose, she was ravenously hungry, but the pain in her heart was a little easier. She went to a restaurant and got some food, then to a dressmaker where she ordered four dresses, two very plain everyday ones, a serviceable dark gray cloth suit, and a soft light gray silk with touches of lavender and lace. She made a heavy list of purchases at brown leaves, and the remainder of the day she did business in her direct and spirited way. At night she was so tired she scarcely could walk home, but she built a fire and cooked and ate a hearty meal. Later she went out by the west fence and gathered an armful of tansy, which she boiled to a thick green tea. Then she stirred an oatmeal until it was a stiff paste. She spread a sheet over her bed and began tearing strips of old muslin. She bandaged each hand and arm with the mixture and plastered the soggy, evil-smelling stuff in a thick poultice over her face and neck. She was so tired she had to sleep, and when she awoke she was half-skinned. She bathed her face and hands, did the work, and went back to town, coming home at night to go through the same process. By the third morning she was a raw, even red. The fourth, she had faded to a brilliant pink under the soothing influence of a cream recommended. That day came a letter from Elnora saying that she would remain where she was until Saturday morning and then come to Ellen Brownlee's at Onabasha and stay for the Saturday session of teachers to arrange their year's work. Sunday was Ellen's last day at home and she wanted Elnora very much. She had to get together the orchestra and practice some Sunday and could not come home until after school Monday night. That suited Mrs. Comstock and she at once answered the letter saying so. The next day Mrs. Comstock was a pale pink and the following a delicate porcelain white. That day she went to a hairdresser and had the great rope of snowy hair which covered her scalp washed, dressed, and fastened with such pins and combs as were decided to be most becoming. She took samples of her dresses, went to a milliner, and bought a street hat to match her suit and a gray satin with lavender orchids to wear with the silk dress. Her last investment was a loose coat of soft gray broadcloth with white lining and touches of lavender on the embroidered collar and gray gloves to match. Then she went home, rested, and worked by turns until Monday. When school closed on that evening, and Elnora, so tired she almost trembled, came down the long walk after a late session of teachers' meeting, a messenger boy stopped her. "'There's a lady wants to see you, most important. I'm to take you to the place,' he said. Elnora groaned. She could not imagine who wanted her, but there was nothing to do but go and find out, tired and anxious to see her mother as she was. "'This is the place,' said the boy, and went his way whistling. Elnora was three blocks from the high school building on the same street. She was before a quaint old house, fresh with paint and covered with vines. There was a long, wide lot, grass-covered, closely set with trees, and a barn and chicken park at the back that seemed to be occupied. Elnora stepped on the veranda, which was furnished with straw rugs, bent hickory chairs, hanging baskets and a table with a workbox and magazines, and knocked at the screen door. Inside she could see bare, polished floors, walls freshly papered in low-toned, harmonious colors, straw rugs and madras curtains. It seemed to be a restful, home-like place to which she had come, and a second later, down an open stairway, came a tall, dark-eyed woman, with cheeks faintly pink and a crown of fluffy, snow-white hair. She wore a lavender gingham dress with white collar and cuffs, and she called as she advanced, "'That screen isn't latched. Open it up and come see your brand-new mother, my girl.' Elnora stepped inside the door. Mother, she cried. You my mother? I don't believe it. Well, you better, said Mrs. Comstock, because it's true. You said you wished I were like the other girls' mothers, and I've shot as close the mark as I could without any practice. 
I thought that walk would be too much for you this winter, so I just rented this house and moved in to be near you and help more in case I'm needed. I've only lived here a day, but I like it so well I've a mortal big notion to buy the place. But mother, protested Eleanor, clinging to her wonderingly, you are perfectly beautiful and this house is a little paradise, but how will we ever pay for it? We can't afford it. Humph! Have you forgotten I telegraphed you I'd found some money I didn't know about? All I've done is paid for, and plenty more to settle for all I propose to do. Mrs. Comstock glanced around with supreme satisfaction. I may get homesick as a pup before spring, she said, but if I do, I can go back. If I don't, I'll sell some timber and put a few oil wells where they don't show much. I can have land enough cleared for a few fields and put a tenant on our farm, and we will buy this and sell it here. It's for sale. You don't look it, but you've surely gone mad, exclaimed Elnora. Just the reverse, my girl, said Mrs. Comstock. I've gone sane. If you are going to undertake this work, you must be convenient to it, and your mother should be where she can see that you are properly dressed, fed, and cared for. This is our, let me think, reception room. How do you like it? This door leads to your workroom and study. I didn't do much there because I wasn't sure of my way, but I knew you would want a rug, curtains, table, shelves for books, and a case for your specimens, so I had a carpenter shelf and enclosed that end of it. Looks pretty neat to me. The dining room and kitchen are back, one of the cows in the barn and some chickens in the coop. I understand that none of the other girls' mothers milk a cow, so a neighbor boy will tend to ours for a third of the milk. There are three bedrooms and a bath upstairs. Go take one, get in some fresh clothes, and come to supper. You can find your room because your things are in it. Elnora kissed her mother over and over and hurried upstairs. She identified her room by the dressing case. There was a pretty rug and curtains, white iron bed, plain and rocking chairs to match her case, a shirtwaist chest, and the big closet was filled with her old clothing and several new dresses. She found the bathroom, bathed, dressed in fresh linen, and went down to a supper that was in evidence of Mrs. Comstock's highest art in cooking. Elnora was so hungry she ate her first real meal in two weeks, but the bites went down slowly because she forgot about them in watching her mother. "'How on earth did you do it?' she said at last. "'I always thought you were naturally brown as a nut.' "'Oh, that was just tan and sunburn,' explained Mrs. Comstock. "'I always knew I was white underneath it. "'I hated to shave my face because I hadn't anything but a sunbonnet, "'and I couldn't stand for it to touch my ears, "'so I went bareheaded and took all the color I accumulated. "'But when I began to think of moving you in to your work, "'I saw I must put up an appearance that wouldn't disgrace you, "'so I thought I'd best remove the crust.' It took some time, and I hope I may die before I ever endure the feel and the smell of the stuff I used again, but it skinned me nicely. What you now see is my own, with just a little dust of rice powder for protection. I'm sort of tender yet. And your lovely, lovely hair, breathed Elnora. Hairdresser did that, said Mrs. Comstock. It costs like smoke, but I watched her, and with a little help from you I can wash it alone next time, though it will be hard work. I let her monkey with it until she said she had found my style. Then I tore it down and had to show me how to build it up again three times. I thought my arms would drop. When I paid the bill for her work, the time I'd taken, the pins and combs she'd used, I nearly had heart failure, but I didn't turn a hair before her. I just smiled at her sweetly and said, how reasonable you are. Come to think of it, she was. She might have charged me ten dollars for what she did just as well as nine seventy-five. I couldn't have helped myself. I made no bargain to begin on. Then Elnora leaned back in her chair and shouted in a gust of hearty laughter, and a little of the ache ceased in her breast. There was no time to thank the remainder of that evening. She was so tired she had to sleep, and her mother did not awaken her until she barely had time to dress, breakfast, and get to school. There was nothing in the new life to remind her of the old, while it seemed as if there never came a minute for retrospection, but her mother appeared on the scene with more work or some entertaining thing to do. Mrs. Comstock invited Elnora's friends to visit her and proved herself a bright and interesting hostess. She digested the subject before she spoke, and when she advanced a view, her point was sure to be original and tersely expressed. Before three months, people waited to hear what she had to say. She kept her appearance so in mind that she made a handsome and a distinguished figure. Elnora never mentioned Philip Ammon, neither did Mrs. Comstock. Early in December came a note in a big box from him. It contained several books on nature subjects, which would be a great help in schoolwork, a number of conveniences Elnora could not afford, 
and a pair of glass-covered plaster casts for each large moth she had. In these, the upper and under wings of male and female showed. Ammon explained that she would break her specimens easily, carrying them about in boxes. He had seen these and thought they would be of use. Oh, Nora was delighted with them, and at once began the tedious process of softening the mountain moths and fitting them to the casts molded to receive them. Her time was so taken in school she progressed slowly, so her mother undertook this work. After trying one or two very common ones, she learned to handle the most delicate with ease. She took keen pride in relaxing the tense moths, fitting them to the cases, polishing the glass covers to the last degree, and sealing them. The results were beautiful to behold. Soon after, Elnora wrote Ammon, Dear friend, I am writing to thank you for the books and the box of conveniences sent me for my work. I can use everything with fine results. Hope I am giving good satisfaction in my position. You will be interested to learn that when the summer's work was classified and pinned, I again had my complete collection for the man of India, save a yellow emperor. I have tried everywhere I know, so has the bird woman. We cannot find a pair for sale. Fate is against me at least this season. I shall have to wait until next year and try again. Thank you very much for helping me with my collection and for the books and things. Sincerely yours, Elnora Comstock. Ammon was disappointed over that note, and instead of keeping it, he tore it into bits and dropped them into the wastebasket. That was precisely what Elnora hoped he would do. Christmas brought beautiful cards of greeting to Mrs. Comstock and Elnora, Easter others, and the year went rapidly towards spring. Elnora's work had been intensely absorbing, and she had gone into it with all her power. She had made it a wonderful success and won new friends. Mrs. Comstock had helped in every way she could, and she was very popular also. Throughout the winter they had enjoyed the city thoroughly, and the change of life it afforded, but signs of spring did wonderful things to the hearts of the country-bred women. A restlessness began on bright February days, calm during March storms, and attacked full force in April. When neither could bear any longer, they were forced to discuss the matter and admit they were growing ill with pure homesickness. They decided to keep the city house during the summer, but to go back to the farm to live just as soon as school closed. So Mrs. Comstock would prepare breakfast and lunch, and then slip away to the farm to make up beds in her plowed garden, plant seeds, trim and tender flowers, and prepare the cabin for occupancy. Then she would go home and make the evening as cheerful as possible for Elnora. In these days, she lived only for the girl. Both of them were glad when the last of May came and the schools closed. They packed the books and clothing they wished to take into a wagon and walked across the fields to the old cabin. As they approached it, Mrs. Comstock said to Elnora, You are sure you won't be lonely here. Elnora knew what she really meant. Quite sure, she said. For a time last fall I was glad to be away, but that all wore out with the winter. Spring made me homesick as I could be. I can scarcely wait until we get back again. So they began that summer just as they had begun all others, with work. But both of them took a new joy in everything, and the violins sang by the hour in the twilight. End of chapter 18《Chapter Nineteen of A Girl the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nineteen, wherein Philip Ammon gives a ball in honor of Edith Carr and Hart Henderson appears on the scene. Edith Carr stood in a vine enclosed side veranda of the Lake Shore Club House, waiting while Philip Ammon gave some important orders. In a few days she would sail for Paris to select a wonderful trousseau she had planned for her marriage in October. Tonight Philip was giving a club dance in her honor, and three hundred of their friends were bidden to share their happiness. Philip had spent days in devising new and exquisite effects and decorations, entertainment, and supper. Weeks before the favored guests had been notified, days before they had received the invitations asking them to participate in this entertainment by Philip Ammon in honor of Miss Carr, they spoke of it as Phil's Dance for Edith. As Edith Carr stood waiting, she smiled softly. She could hear the rumble of carriages and the panting of automobiles as in a steady stream they rolled to the front entrance. She could catch glimpses of floating draperies of gauze and lace, the flash of jewels and the passing of exquisite color. Everyone was newly arrayed in her honor in the loveliest clothing and the most expensive jewels they could command. As she thought of it, she lifted her head a trifle higher and her eyes flashed proudly. 
She was robed in a French creation suggested and designed by Philip. He had said to her, I know a competent judge who says the distinctive feature of June is her exquisite big night moths. I want you to be the very essence of June that night, as you will be the embodiment of love. Be a moth. The most beautiful of them is either the pale green Luna or the yellow Imperialis. Be my moon lady or my gold empress. He took her to the museum and showed her the moths. She instantly decided on the yellow, secretly because she knew the shades would make her more startlingly beautiful than any other color. To him she said, A moon lady seems so far away and cold. I would be of earth and very near on that night. I choose the empress. So she matched the colors exactly, wrote out the idea and forwarded in the order to Paquin. Tonight, when Philip Ammon came for her, he stood speechless for a minute and then silently kissed her hands. For she stood tall, lithe, of grace and born, her dark waving hair high piled and crossed by gold bands studded with amethyst, and at one side an enameled lavender orchid rimmed with diamonds, which flashed and sparkled. The soft yellow robe of lightest weight velvet fitted her form perfectly, while from each shoulder fell a great velvet wing lined with lavender, and flecked with embroidery of that color in imitation of the moth. Around her throat was a wonderful necklace, and on her arms were bracelets of gold set with amethyst and rimmed with diamonds. Philip had said that her gloves, fan, and slippers must be lavender, because the feet of the moth were that color. These accessories had been made to order and embroidered with gold. It had been arranged that her mother, Philip's, and a few best friends should receive his guests. She was to appear when she led the grand march with Philip Ammon. Miss Carr was as positive that she would be the most beautiful, most exquisitely gowned woman present as she was of life. In her heart she thought of herself as imperialist regalis, as the yellow empress. In a few moments she would stun her world into feeling it as Philip Ammon had done, for she had taken pains that the history of her costume should be whispered to a few who would give it circulation. She lifted her head proudly and waited, for was not Philip planning something unusual and unsurpassed in her honor? Then she smiled. But in all the fragmentary thoughts crossing her brain, the one that never came was that Philip Ammon as the emperor. Philip, the king of her heart, and at least her equal in all things. She was the empress, yes, but Philip was a mere man, to devise entertainments, to provide luxuries, to humor whims, to kiss hands. Ah, oh, my luck, cried a voice behind her. Edith Carr turned and smiled exquisitely. I thought you were on the ocean, she said. I only reached the dock, replied the man, when I had a letter that recalled me by the first limited. Oh, important business. The only business of any importance in all the world to me. I'm triumphant that I came. Edith, you are the most superb woman in every respect I have ever seen. One glimpse is worth the whole journey. You like my dress? She moved toward him and turned, lifting her arms. Do you know what it is intended to represent? Yes, Polly Ammon told me. I knew when I heard about how you would look, so I started a sleuth hunt to get the first peep. Edith, I can become intoxicated just with looking at you tonight. He half closed his eyes and smilingly stared straight at her. He was taller than she, a lean man, with close-cropped light hair, steel gray eyes, a square chin, and man of the world written all over him. Edith Carr flushed. I thought you realized when you went away that you were to stop that heart, Henderson, she cried. I did, but this letter of which I tell you called me back to start it all over again. She came a step closer. Who wrote that letter, and what did it contain concerning me? She demanded. One of your most intimate chums wrote it. It contained the hazard that possibly I'd given up too soon. It said that in a fit of petulance you had broken your engagement with Ammon twice this winter, and he had come back because he knew you did not really mean it. I thought hard there on the dock when I read that, and my boat sailed without me. I argued that anything so weak as an engagement twice broken and patched up again was a mighty frail affair indeed and likely to smash completely at any time, so I came on the run. I said once I would not see you marry any other man. Because I could not bear it, I planned to go into exile of any sort to escape that. I've changed my mind. I've come back to haunt you until the ceremony is over. Then I go. Not before. I was insane. The girl laughed merrily. Not half so insane as you are now, Hart, she cried gaily. You know that Philip Ammon has been devoted to me all my life. Well, now I'll tell you something else, because this looks serious for you. I love him with all my heart. Not while he lives shall he know it, and I will laugh at him if you tell him. But the fact remains, I intend to marry him. But no doubt I shall tease him constantly. 
It's good for a man to be uncertain. If you could see Adam's face at the quarterly return of his ring, you would understand the fun of it. You had better have taken your boat. Possibly, said Henderson calmly, but you are the only woman in the world for me, and while you are free, as I now see my light, I stay by you. You know the old adage. But I'm not free, cried Edith Carr. I'm just telling you I am not. This night is my public acknowledgment that Phil and I are promised, as our world has surmised since we were children. That promise is an actual fact because of what I just have told you. My little fits of temper don't count with Phil. He's been raised on them. In fact, I often invent one in a perfect calm to see him perform. He is the most amusing spectacle. But please, please do understand that I love him and always will, that we will be married. Just the same, I'll wait and see it an accomplished fact, said Henderson. And Edith, because I love you, with the sort of love it is worth a woman's while to inspire, I want your happiness before my own. So I'm going to say this to you, for I never dreamed you were capable of the feeling you have displayed for Phil. If you do love him, and have loved him always, a disappointment would cut you deeper than you know. Go careful from now on. Don't strain that patch engagement of yours any farther. I've known Philip all my life. I've known him through boyhood and college and since. All men respect him. Where the rest of us confess our sins, he stands clean. You can go to his arms with nothing to forgive. Mark this thing. I've heard him say... Edith is my slogan, and I've seen him march home strong in the strength of his love for you in the face of temptations before which every other man of us fell. Before the gods, that ought to be worth something to a girl. She really is the delicate, sensitive, refined thing she would have man believe. It would take a woman with the organism of an ostrich to endure some of the men here tonight, if she knew them as I do, but Phil is sound to the core. So this is what I would say to you. First, your instincts are right in loving him. Why not let him feel in the ways a woman knows? Second, don't break your engagement again. As men know the man, any of us would be afraid to the soul. He loves you, yes. He is long-suffering for you, yes. But men know he has a limit. When the limit is reached, he will stand fast and all the powers can't move him. You don't seem to think it, but you can go too far. Is that all? laughed Edith Carr sarcastically. No, there is one thing more, said Henderson. Here or hereafter, now and so long as I breathe, I am your slave. You can do anything you choose and know that I will kneel before you again. So carry this in the depths of your heart. Now or at any time in any place or condition, merely lift your hand and I will come. Anything you want of me, that thing will I do. I'm going to wait. If you need me, it is not necessary to speak. Only give me the faintest sign. All your life I will be somewhere near you waiting for it. Idiot! You rave! laughed Edith Carr. How you would frighten me! What a bugbear you would raise! Be sensible and go find what keeps Phil. I was waiting patiently, but my patience is going. I won't look nearly so well as I do now when it is gone. At that instant, Philip Ammon entered. He was in full evening dress and exceptionally handsome. Everything is ready, he said. They are waiting for us to lead the march. It is formed. Edith Carr smiled entrancingly. Do you think I am ready? Philip looked what he thought and offered his arm. Edith Carr nodded carelessly to Henderson and moved away. Servants parted the curtains and the yellow empress, bowing right and left, swept the length of the ballroom and took her place at the head of the form procession. The gray open dancing pavilion was draped with yellow silk caught up with lilac flowers. Every corner was filled with bloom of those colors. The music was played by harpers dressed in yellow and violet, and the ball opened. The midnight supper was served with the same colors and the last half of the program was well under way. Never had girl been more complimented and petted in the same length of time than Edith Carr. Every minute she seemed to grow more worthy of praise. A partner's dance was called and the floor was filled with couples waiting for the music. Ammon stood whispering delightful things to Edith facing him. From out of the night, in at the wide front entrance of the pavilion, there swept in slow, wavering flight a great yellow moth and fluttered toward the center cluster of glaring electric lights. Philip Ammon and Edith Carr saw it at the same instant. "'Why, isn't that?' she began excitedly. "'It's a yellow emperor. This is fate,' cried Ammon. "'The last one Elnora needs for her collection. I must have it. Excuse me.' He ran toward the light. "'Hats, handkerchiefs, fans, anything,' he panted. "'Everyone, hold up something and stop that. It's a moth. I've got to catch it.' "'He wants it for Edith,' ran in a murmur around the hall. The girl's face flushed while she bit her lip in vexation. 
Instantly everyone began holding up something to keep the moth from flying back into the night. One fan held straight before it served, and the moth gently settled on it. Hold steady, cried Ammon. Don't move for your life. He rushed toward the moth, made a quick sweep, and held it up between his fingers. All right, he called. Thanks, everyone. Excuse me a minute. He ran to the office. An ounce of gasoline, quick, he ordered. A cigar box, a cork, and the glue bottle. He poured some glue into the bottom of the box, set the cork in it firmly, dashed the gasoline over the moth repeatedly, pinned it to the cork, poured the remainder of the liquid over it, closed the box, and fastened it. Then he laid a bill on the counter. Pack that box with cork around it, and one twice its size, tie securely, and express to this address at once. He scribbled on a sheet of paper and shoved it over. On your honor, will you do that faithfully as I say? he asked the clerk. Certainly, was the reply. Then keep the change, called Ammon as he ran back to the pavilion. Edith Carr stood where he left her, thinking rapidly. She heard the murmur that went up when Philip started to capture the exquisite golden creature she was impersonating. She saw the flash of surprise that went over unrestrained faces when he ran from the room, without even showing it to her. The last one Elnora needs rang in her ears. He had told her that he helped collect moths the previous summer, but she had understood that the bird woman, with whose work Miss Carr was familiar, wanted them to put in a book. He had spoken of a country girl he had met who played the violin wonderfully, and at times he had showed a disposition to exalt her as a standard of womanhood. Miss Carr had ignored what he said and talked to something else, but that girl's name had been Elnora. It was she who was collecting moths. No doubt she was the competent judge who was responsible for the yellow costume Philip had devised. Had Edith Carr been in her room, she would have torn off the dress at the thought. Being in a circle of her best friends, which to her meant her keenest rivals and harshest critics, she grew rigid with anger. Her breath hurt her paining chest. No one thought to speak to the musicians, and, seeing the floor filled, they began the waltz. Only half the guests could see what happened, and at once the others formed and commenced to dance. Laughing couples came sweeping past her. Edith Carr grew very white as she stood alone. Her lips turned pale while her dark eyes flamed with anger. She stood perfectly still where Philip had left her, and the approaching men guided their partners around her, while the girls, looking back, could be seen making exclamations of surprise. The idolized only daughter of the Carr family hoped that she would drop dead from mortification, but nothing happened. She was too perverse to step aside laughingly and say that she was waiting for Philip. Then came Tom Levering, dancing with Polly Ammon. Being in the scales with the Ammon family, Tom scented trouble from afar, so he whispered to Polly, "'Edith is standing in the middle of the floor, and she's awful mad about something.' "'That won't hurt her,' laughed Polly. "'It's an old pose of hers. She knows she looks superb when she's angry, so she keeps herself furious half the time on purpose.' "'She looks like the mischief,' answered Tom. "'Hadn't we better steer over and wait with her? She's the ugliest sod I ever saw.' "'Why, Tom!' cried Polly. "'Stop, quickly!' they hurried to Edith. "'Come, dear,' said Polly. "'We are going to wait with you until Phil gets back. "'Let's go for a drink. I am so thirsty.' "'Yes, do,' begged Tom, offering his arm. "'Let's get out of here until Phil comes.' There was an opportunity to laugh and walk away, but Edith Carr would not accept it. Anger only seemed to flame higher. "'My betrothed left me here,' she said. "'Here I shall remain until he returns for me, "'and then he will be my betrothed no longer.' Polly grasped Edith's arm. "'Oh, Edith,' she implored, "'don't make a scene here in tonight. "'Edith, this has been the loveliest dance "'ever given at the clubhouse. "'Everyone is saying so. "'Edith, darling, do come. "'Phil will be back in a second. "'He can explain. "'It's only a breath since I saw him go out. "'I thought he had returned.' As Polly panted these disjointed ejaculations, Tom Levering began to grow angry on her account. He has been gone just long enough to show every one of his guests that he will leave me standing alone like a neglected fool for any passing whim of his. Explain! His explanation would sound well. Do you know for whom he caught that moth? It is being sent to a girl he flirted with all last summer. It has just occurred to me that the dress I am wearing is her suggestion. Let him try to explain speech unloosed the fountain she stripped off her gloves to free her hands at that instant the dancers parted to admit philip instinctively they stopped as they approached and with wondering faces walled in edith and philip polly and tom mighty good of you to wait cried ammon his face beaming with delight over his success in capturing the yellow emperor i thought when i heard the music you were going on 
How did you think I was going on? demanded Edith Carr in frigid tones. I thought you would step aside and wait a few seconds for me, or dance with Henderson. It was most important to have that moth. It just completes a valuable collection for a person who needs the money. Come. He held out his arms. I step aside for no one, stormed Edith Carr. I await no other girl's pleasure. You may complete the collection with that. She drew her engagement ring from her finger and reached to place it in one of Philip's outstretched hands. Ammon saw and drew back. Instantly, Edith dropped the ring. As it fell, almost instinctively, Philip caught it in air. With amazed face, he looked closely at Edith Carr. Her distorted features were scarcely recognizable. He held the ring toward her. Edith, for the love of mercy, wait until I can explain, he begged. Put on your ring and let me tell you how it is. I know perfectly how it is, she answered. I never will wear that ring again. You won't even hear what I have to say? You won't take back your ring? he cried. Never! Your conduct is infamous! Come to think of it, said Ammon deliberately, it is infamous to cut a girl who has danced all her life out of a few measures of a waltz. As for asking forgiveness for so black a sin as picking up a moth and starting it to a friend who lives by collecting them, I don't see how I could. I've not been gone three minutes by the clock, Edith. Put on your ring and finish the dance like a dear girl. He thrust the glittering ruby into her fingers and again held out his arms. She dropped the ring and it rolled some distance from them. Henderson followed its shining course and caught it before it was lost. You really mean it, demanded Ammon, in a voice as cold as hers ever had been. You know I mean it, cried Edith Carr. I accept your decision in the presence of these witnesses, said Philip Ammon. Where is my father? he asked of those around them. The elder Ammon, with a distressed face, hurried to him. Father, take my place, said Philip. Excuse me to my guests. Ask all my friends to forgive me. I am going out for a time. He turned and walked from the pavilion. As he went, Hart Henderson rushed to Edith Carr and forced the ring into her fingers. Edith, quick, come quick, he implored. There's just time to catch him. If you let him go that way, he never will return in this world. Remember what I told you. Great prophet, aren't you, Hart? she sneered. Who wants him to return? If that ring is thrust upon me again, I shall fling it into the lake. Signal the musicians to begin and take this dance with me. Henderson put the ring into his pocket and began the dance. He could feel the muscular spasms of the girl in his arms. Her face was cold and hard, but her breath burned with a scorch of fever. She finished the dance and all others, taking Phil's numbers with Henderson, who had arrived too late to arrange a program. She left with the others, merely inclining her head as she passed Ammon's father, taking his place, and entered the big touring car for which Henderson had telephoned. She sank limply into a seat and moaned softly. "'Shall I drive a while in the night air?' asked Henderson. She nodded. Henderson instructed the chauffeur. She raised her head in a few seconds. "'Hart, I'm going to pieces,' she said. "'Won't you put your arm around me a little while?' Henderson gathered her into his arms, and her head fell on his shoulder. "'Closer!' she cried. Henderson gripped her with the strength of a practiced athlete and held her until his arms were numb, but he did not know it. The tricks of fate are cruel enough, but there scarcely could have been a worse one than that. To care for a woman as he loved Edith Carr and have her given into his arms because she was so numb with misery over her trouble with another man that she did not know or care what she did. Dawn was streaking the east when he spoke to her. Edith, it is growing light. Take me home, she said. Henderson helped her up the steps and rang the bell. When the door was opened, he went inside and guided her to her room. Miss Carzill, he said to the footman, rouse her maid instantly and have her prepare something hot as quickly as possible. Edith, he cried, just a word. I've been thinking. It isn't too late yet. Take your ring and put it on. I will go find Phil at once and tell him you have, that you are expecting him and he will come. Think what he said, she cried. He accepted my decision as final, in the presence of witnesses, as if it were court. He can return it to me if I ever wear it again. You think that now, but in a few days you will find that you feel very differently. Living a life of heartache is no joke and no job for a woman. Put on your ring and send me to tell him to come. No. Edith, there was not a soul who saw that but sympathized with Phil. It was ridiculous for you to get so angry over a thing which was never intended for the slightest offense, and by no logical reasoning could have been so considered. Do you think that? she demanded. I do, said Henderson. If you had laughed and stepped aside an instant, or laughed and stayed where you were, Phil would have been back, or, if he needed punishment in your eyes, to have found me having one of his dances would have been enough. I was waiting. You could have called me with one look. 
but to publicly do and say what you did, my lady, I know Phil, and I know you went too far. Put on that ring and send him word you are sorry before it is too late. I will not. He shall come to me. Then God help you, said Henderson, for you are plunging into misery whose depths you do not dream. Edith, I beg of you. She swayed where she stood. Her maid opened the door and caught her. Henderson went down the hall and out to his car. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of a Girl the Limber Lost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Wherein the Elder Ammon Offers Advice and Edith Carr Experiences Regrets. Philip Ammon walked from among his friends a humiliated and a wounded man. Never before had Edith Carr appeared quite so beautiful. All evening she had treated him with unusual consideration. Never had he loved her so deeply. Then, in a few seconds, everything was different. Seeing the change in her face and hearing her meaningless accusations killed something in his heart. Warmth went out and a cold weight took its place. But even after that he had offered the ring to her again and asked her before others to reconsider. The answer had been further insult. He walked straight ahead, paying no heed to where he went. He had traversed many miles when he became aware that his feet had chosen familiar streets. He was passing his home. Dawn was near, but the first floor was lighted. He staggered up the steps and was instantly admitted. The library door stood open, while his father sat with a book pretending to read. At Philip's entrance, the father scarcely glanced up. "'Come on,' he called. "'I've just told Banks to bring me a cup of coffee before I turn in. Have one with me.' Philip sat by the table and leaned his head on his hands, but he drank a cup of steaming coffee and felt better. "'Father,' he said, "'Father, may I talk with you a little while?' "'Of course,' answered Mr. Ammon. "'I'm not at all tired. "'I think I must have been waiting in the hope that you would come. "'I want no one's version of this but yours. "'Tell me the straight of the thing, Phil.' "'Philip told all he knew while his father sat in deep thought. "'On my life I can't see any occasion for such a display of temper, Phil. "'It passed all bounds of reason and breeding. "'Can't you think of anything more?' "'I cannot. "'Polly says everyone expected you to carry the moth you caught to Edith. "'Why didn't you?' She screams if a thing of that kind comes near her. She never has taken the slightest interest in them. I was in a big hurry. I didn't want to miss one minute of my dance with her. The moth was not so uncommon, but by a combination of bad luck it had become the rarest in America for a friend of mine, who is making a collection to pay college expenses. For an instant last June the series was completed, when a woman's uncontrolled temper ruined the specimen and the search for it began over. A few days later a pair was secured, and again the money was in sight for several hours, then an accident wrecked one-fourth of the collection. I helped replace those last June, all but this yellow emperor, which we could not secure, and we haven't been able to find, buy, or trade for one since. So my friend was compelled to teach us past winter instead of going to college. When that moth came flying in there tonight, it seemed to me like fate. All I thought of was that to secure it would complete the collection and get the money. So I caught the emperor and started it to Elnora. I declare to you that I was not out of the pavilion over three minutes at a liberal estimate. If I only had thought to speak to the orchestra, I was sure I would be back before enough couples gathered and formed for the dance. The eyes of the elder Ammon were very bright. The friend for whom you wanted this moth is a girl, he asked indifferently as he ran the book leaves through his fingers. The girl of whom I wrote you last summer and told you about in the fall, I helped her all the time I was away. Did Edith know of her? I tried many times to tell her, to interest her, but she was so indifferent that it was insulting. She would not hear me. We are neither one in any condition to sleep. Why don't you begin at the first, and tell me about this girl? To think of other matters for a time I clear out vision for a sane solution of this. Who is she? Just what is she doing, and what is she like? You know I was reared among those limber lost people. I can understand readily. What is her name, and where does she live? Philip gave a man's version of the previous summer, while his father played with the book industriously. You are very sure as to her refinement and education, he asked. In almost two months' daily association, could a man be mistaken? She can far and away beat Polly, Edith, or any girl of our set on any common high school or supplementary branch, and you know high schools have French, German, and physics now. Besides, she is a graduate of two other institutions. All her life she has been in the school of hard knocks. She has the biggest, tenderest, most human heart I ever knew in a girl. She has known life in its most cruel phases, and instead of hardening her, and has set her trying to save other people's suffering. Then this nature position of which I told you. She graduated in the school of the woods before she got that. 
The bird woman, whose work you know, helped her there. Oh, Nora knows more interesting things in a minute than any other girl I ever met knew in an hour, provided you are a person who cares to understand plant and animal life. The book leaves slid rapidly through his fingers as the father drawled. What sort of looking girl is she? Tall as Edith, a little heavier, pink, even complexion, wide open blue-gray eyes with heavy black brows, and lashes so long they touch her cheeks. She has a rope of waving, shining hair that makes a real crown on her head, and it appears almost red in the light. She is as handsome as any fair woman I ever saw, but she doesn't know it. Every time anyone pays her a compliment, her mother, who is a caution, discovers that for some reason the girl is a fright, so she has no appreciation of her looks. And you were in daily association two months with a girl like that. How about it, Phil? If you mean, did I trifle with her? No, cried Philip hotly. I told her the second time I met her all about Edith. Almost every day I wrote to Edith in her presence. Elnora gathered violets and made a fancy basket to put them in for Edith's birthday. I started to air in too open admiration for Elnora, but her mother brought me up with a whirl I never forgot. Fifty times a day in the swamps and forests Elnora made a perfect picture, but I neither looked nor said anything. I never met any girl so downright noble and bearing in actions. I never hated anything as I hated leaving her, for we were dear friends like two wholly congenial men. Her mother was almost always with us. She knew how much I admired Elnora, but so long as I concealed it from the girl, the mother did not care. Yet you left such a girl and came back wholehearted to Edith Carr. Surely you know how it has been with me about Edith all my life. Yet the girl you picture is far her superior to an unprejudiced person when thinking what a man would require in a wife to be happy. I never have thought what I would require to be happy. I only thought whether I could make Edith happy. I've been an idiot. What I've borne you'll never know. Tonight is only one of many outbursts like that in varying and lesser degrees. Phil, I love you when you say you have thought only of Edith. I happen to know that it is true. You are my only son, and I've had a right to watch you closely. I believe you utterly. Anyone who cares for you as I do and has had my years of experience in this world over yours knows that in some ways tonight would be a blessed release, if you could take it. But you cannot. Go to bed now and get some rest. Tomorrow, go back to her and fix it up. You heard what I said when I left her. I said because something in my heart died a minute before that, and I realized that it was my love for Edith Carr. Never again will I voluntarily face such a scene. If she can act like that at a ball before hundreds, over a thing of which I thought nothing at all, she would go into actual physical fits and spasms over some of the household crises I have seen the matter meet with a smile. Sir, it is truth that I have thought only of her up to the present. Now I will admit I am thinking about myself. Father, did you see her? Life is too short and it can be too sweet to throw away in a bottle with an unrestrained woman. I am no fighter, where a girl is concerned anyway. I respect and love her, or I do nothing. Never again is either respect or love possible between me and Edith Carr. Whenever I think of her in the future, I will see her as she was tonight. But I can't face the crowd just yet. Could you spare me a few days? It is only ten days until you were to go north for the summer. Go now. I don't want to go north. I don't want to meet people I know. There the story would precede me. I do not need pitying glances or rough condolences. I wonder if I could not hide at Uncle Ed's in Wisconsin for a while. The book closed suddenly. The father leaned across the table and looked into the son's eyes. Phil, are you sure of what you just have said? Quite sure. Do you think you are in any condition to decide tonight? Death cannot return to life, father. My love for Edith Carr is dead. I hope never to see her again. If I thought you could be certain so soon. But come to think of it, you are very like me in many ways. I am with you in this. Public scenes and disgraces I would not endure. It would be over with me, were I in your position, that I know. It is done for all time, said Philip Ammon. Let us not speak of it further. Then Phil, the father leaned closer and looked at the son tenderly. Phil, why don't you go to the Limberlust? Father! Why not? No one can comfort a hurt heart like a tender woman. And Phil, have you ever stopped to think that you may have a duty in the Limberlust if you are free? I don't know. I only suggest it. But for a country schoolgirl, unaccustomed to men, two months with a man like you might well awaken feelings of which you do not think. Because you were safeguarded as no sign the girl was, she might care to see you. You can soon tell. With you she comes next to Edith, and you have made it clear to me that you appreciate her in many ways above. So I repeat it. Why not go to the Limberlust? 
A long time Philip Ammon sat in deep thought. At last he raised his head. "'Well, why not?' he said. "'Years could make me no surer than I am now, and life is short. Please ask Banks to get me some coffee and toast, and I will bathe and dress so I can take the early train. Go to your bath. I will attend to your packing and everything. And, Phil, if I were you, I would leave no addresses.' "'Not an address,' said Ammon. "'Not even Polly.' When the train pulled out, the elder Ammon went home to find Hart Henderson waiting. "'Where is Phil?' he demanded. "'He did not feel like facing his friends at present, and I am just back from driving him to the station. He said he might go to Siam or Patagonia. He would leave no address.' Henderson almost staggered. "'He's not gone, and left no address? You don't mean it. He'll never forgive her.' "'Never is a long time, Hart,' said Mr. Ammon, "'and it seems even longer to those of us who are well acquainted with Phil. "'Last night was not the last straw. It was the whole straw stack. "'It crushed Phil so far as she is concerned. "'He will not see her again voluntarily, and he will not forget if he does. "'You can take it from him and from me. We have accepted the lady's decision. "'Will you have a cup of coffee?' "'Twice Henderson opened his lips to speak of Edith Carr's despair.' Twice he looked into the stern, inflexible face of Mr. Ammon and could not betray her. He held out the ring. "'I've no instructions as to that,' said the elder Ammon, drawing back. "'Possibly Miss Carr would have it as a keepsake.' "'I am sure not,' said Henderson curtly. "'Then suppose you return it to Peacock. I will phone him. He will give you the price of it, and you might add it to the Children's Fresh Air Fund. We would be obliged if you would do that. No one here cares to handle the object.' "'As you choose,' said Henderson. "'Good morning.' Then he went to his home, but he could not think of sleep. He ordered breakfast, but he could not eat. He paced the library for a time, but it was too small. Going out in the streets, he walked until exhausted. Then he called a hansom and was driven to his club. He had thought himself familiar with every depth of suffering. That night had taught him that what he felt for himself was not to be compared with the anguish which wrung his heart over the agony of Edith Carr. He tried to blame Philip Ammon, but being an honest man, Henderson knew that was unjust. The fault lay wholly with her, but that only made it harder for him, as he realized it would in time for her. As he sauntered into the room, an attendant hurried to him. "'You are wanted most urgently at the phone, Mr. Henderson,' he said. "'You have had three calls from Main 5770.' Henderson shivered as he picked down the receiver and gave the call. "'Is that you, Hart?' came Edith's voice. "'Yes.' "'Did you find Phil?' "'No.' "'Did you try?' "'Yes. As soon as I left you, I went straight there.' "'Wasn't he home yet?' "'He has been home and gone again.' "'Gone!' the cry tore Henderson's heart. "'Shall I come and tell you, Edith?' "'No, tell me now.' "'When I got to the house, Banks said Mr. Ammon and Phil were out in the motor, so I waited. Mr. Ammon came back soon. "'Edith, are you alone?' "'Yes, go on. Call your maid. I can't tell you until someone is with you. "'Tell me instantly.' "'Edith, he said he had been to the station.' He said Phil had started to Siam or Patagonia. He didn't know which and left no address. He said... Distinctly, Henderson heard her fall. He set the buzzer ringing and in a few seconds heard voices so he knew she had been found. Then he crept into a private den and shook with a hard, nervous chill. The next day, Edith Carr started on her trip to Europe. Henderson felt certain she hoped to meet Philip there. He was sure she would be disappointed, though he had no idea where Ammon could have gone but after much thought he decided he would see Edith soonest by remaining at home, so he spent the summer in Chicago. End of chapter 20"'We must be thinking about supper, mother,' said Elnora, as she set the wings of a cecropia with great care. "'It seems as if I can't get enough to eat, or enough of being at home. I enjoyed that city house. I don't believe I could have gotten through my work if I had been compelled to walk back and forth. I thought at first I never wanted to come here again. Now I feel as if I could not live anywhere else.' "'Elnora,' said Mrs. Comstock, "'there's someone coming down the road. Coming here, do you think?' "'Yes, coming here, I suspect.' Elnora glanced quickly at her mother and then turned to the road as Philip Ammon reached the gate. "'Careful, mother,' the girl instantly warned. "'If you change your treatment of him a hair's breadth, he will suspect. Come with me to meet him.' She dropped her work and sprang up. "'Well, of all the delightful surprises!' she cried. 
She was a trifle thinner than during the previous summer. On her face there was a more mature, patient look, but the sun struck her bare head with the same ray of red gold. She wore one of the old blue gingham dresses, open at the throat and rolled to the elbows. Mrs. Comstock did not look at all the same woman, but Ammon saw only Elnora, heard only her greeting. He caught both hands where she offered but one. Elnora, he cried, if you were engaged to me and we were at a ball among hundreds where I offended you very much, and didn't even know I'd done anything, and if I asked you before all of them to allow me to explain, to forgive me, to wait, would your face grow distorted and unfamiliar with anger? Would you drop my ring on the floor and insult me repeatedly? Oh, Elnora, would you? Elnora's big eyes seemed to leap while her face grew very white. She wrenched away her hands. Hush, Phil, hush, she protested. That fever has you again. You are dreadfully ill. You don't know what you are saying. I'm sleepless and exhausted. I'm heartsick, but I'm well as I ever was. Answer me, Elnora, would you? Answer nothing, cried Mrs. Comstock. If Wesley Sinton had been speaking to her just then, he would have called her Kate. Answer nothing. Hang your coat there on your nail, Phil, and come split some kindling. Elnora, clean away that stuff and set the table. Can't you see the boy is starved and tired? He's come home to rest and get a decent meal. Come on, Phil. Mrs. Comstock marched away, and Ammon hung his coat in its old place and followed. Out of sight and hearing, she turned on him. Do you call yourself a man or a hound? she flared. I beg your pardon, stammered Philip Ammon. I should think you would, she ejaculated. I'll admit you did the square thing and was a man last summer, though I'd like it better if you'd faced up and told me you were promised. But to come back here babying and take hold of Elnora like that, and talk that way because you have had a fuss with your girl, I don't tolerate. Split that kindling and I'll get your supper and then you best go. I won't have you working on Elnora's big heart because you have quarreled with someone else. You'll have it patched up in a week and be gone again so you can go right away. Mrs. Comstock, I came here to ask Elnora to marry me. The more fool you then, cried Mrs. Comstock. This time yesterday you were engaged to another woman, no doubt. Now, for some little flare-up, you come racing here to use Elnora as a tool to spite the other girl. A week of sane living and you will be sorry and ready to go back to Chicago, or, if you really are man enough to be sure of yourself, she will come to claim you. She has her rights. An engagement of years is a serious matter and not broken for a whim. If you don't go, she'll come. Then, when you patch up your affairs and go sailing away together, where does my girl come in? I am a lawyer, Mrs. Comstock, said Ammon. It appeals to me as beneath your ordinary sense of justice to decide a case without hearing the evidence. It is due me that you hear me first. Hear your side, flashed Mrs. Comstock. I'd a heap sight rather hear the girl. I wish to my soul that you had heard and seen her last night, Mrs. Comstock, said Ammon. Then my way would be clear. I never even thought of coming here today. I'll admit I would have come in time, but not for many months. My father sent me. Your father sent you, repeated Mrs. Comstock. Why? Father, mother, and Polly were present last night. They and all my friends saw me insulted and disgraced in the worst exhibition of uncontrolled temper any of us ever witnessed. All of them knew it was the end. Father liked what I had told him of Elnora, and he advised me to come here, so I came. If she does not want me, I can leave instantly. But, oh, I hope she would understand. You people are not splitting wood, called Elnora from the back door. Oh, yes, we are, answered Mrs. Comstock. You set out the things for biscuit and lay the table. She turned again to Ammon. I know considerable about your father, she said. I've met your uncle's family frequently this winter. I've heard your Aunt Anna say that she didn't at all like Miss Carr and that she and all your family secretly hoped that something would happen to prevent your marrying her. That chimes right in with your saying that your father sent you here. I guess you better speak your piece. Ammon gave his version of the previous night. Do you believe me? He finished. Yes, said Mrs. Comstock. May I stay? Oh, it looks all right for you, but what about her? Nothing, so far as I am concerned. Her plans were all made to start to Europe today. I suspect she is on the way by this time. All Nora is very sensible, Mrs. Comstock. Hadn't you better let her decide this? The final decision rests with her, of course, admitted Mrs. Comstock. But look you one thing. She's all I have. As Solomon says, she is the one child, the only child of her mother. I've suffered enough in this world that I fight against any suffering which threatens her. So far as I know, you've always been a man, and you may stay. But if you bring tears and heartache to her, don't have the assurance to think I'll bear it tamely. I'll get right up and fight like a catamount if things go wrong for Elnora.
I have no doubt but you will, replied Ammon, and I don't blame you in the least if you do. I have the utmost devotion to offer Elnora, a good home, fair social position, and my family will love her dearly. Think it over. I know it is sudden, but my father advised it. Yes, I reckon he did, said Mrs. Comstock dryly. I guess instead of me being the catamount, you had the genuine article up in Chicago, masquerading in peacock feathers and posing as a fine lady, until her time came to scratch. Human nature seems to be pretty much the same the world over. But I'd give a pretty to know that secret thing you say you don't that set her to raving over your just catching a moth for all Nora. You might get that crock of strawberries in the spring house. They prepared and ate supper. Afterward, they sat in the arbor and talked, or Elnora played until time for Ammon to go. "'Will you walk to the gate with me?' he asked Elnora as he arose. "'Not tonight,' she answered lightly. "'Come early in the morning, if you like, and we will go over to Sleepy Snake Creek and hunt moths and gather dandelions for dinner.' Ammon leaned toward her. "'May I tell you tomorrow why I came?' he asked. "'I think not,' replied Elnora. "'The fact is, I don't care why you came.' It is enough for me that we are your very good friends, and that in trouble you have found us a refuge. I fancy we had better live a week or two before you say anything. There is a possibility what you have to say may change in that length of time. It will not change one iota, cried Ammon. Then it will have the grace of that much age to give it some small touch of flavor, said the girl. Come early in the morning. She lifted the violin and began to play a dainty fairy dance. "'Well, bless my soul!' softly ejaculated the astounded Mrs. Comstock. "'To think I was worrying for fear you couldn't take care of yourself!' Elnora laughed as she played. "'Shall I tell you what he said?' inquired Mrs. Comstock. "'Nope, I don't want to hear it,' said Elnora. "'He is only six hours from Chicago. "'I'll give her a week to find him and fix it up if he stays that long. "'If she don't put in an appearance then, "'he can tell me what he wants to say, "'and I'll take my time to think it over. "'Time is plenty, too.' There are three of us in this, and one has got to be left with a sore heart for life. If the decision rests with me, I propose to be very sure that it is the one who deserves such hard luck. Let's go to bed. The next morning, Ammon came early, dressed in the outing clothing he had worn the previous summer, and aside from a slight paleness, seemed very much the same as when he left. Elnora met him on the old footing, and for a week life went on exactly as it had the previous summer. Mrs. Comstock made mental notes and watched in silence. She could see that Elnora was on a strain, though she hoped Ammon would not. The girl grew restless as the week drew to a close. Once, when the gate clicked, she suddenly lost color and moved nervously. Billy came down the walk. Ammon leaned toward Mrs. Comstock and said, I am expressly forbidden to speak to Elnora as I would like just now. Would you mind telling her for me that I had a letter from my father this morning saying that Miss Carr is on her way to Europe for the summer? Elnora, said Mrs. Comstock promptly, I've just heard that car woman is on her way to Europe, and I wish to my gracious star she'd stay there. Philip Ammon shouted, but Elnora rose hastily and went to meet Billy. They came into the arbor together, and after speaking to Mrs. Comstock and Ammon, Billy said, Uncle Wesley and I found something funny, and we thought you'd like to see. I don't know what I should do without you and Uncle Wesley to help me, said Elnora. What have you found now? Something I couldn't bring. You have to come to it. I tried to get one, and I killed it. They are a kind of insecty things, and they got a long tail that is three fine hairs. They stick those hairs right into the hard bark of trees, and if you pull, the hairs stay fast, and it kills the bug. We will come at once, laughed Elnora. I know what they are, and I can use some in my work. Billy, have you been crying? inquired Mrs. Comstock. Billy lifted a chastened face. Yes, ma'am, he replied. This has been the worst day. What's the matter with the day? The day is all right, admitted Billy. I mean, every single thing has gone wrong with me. Now that is too bad, sympathized Mrs. Comstock. Tell me about it. Began early this morning, said Billy. All Snap's fault, too. Now what has poor Snap been doing? demanded Mrs. Comstock, her eyes beginning to twinkle. Digging for woodchucks, just like he always does. He gets up at two o'clock to dig for them. He was coming in from the woods all tired and covered thick with dirt. I was going to the barn with a pail of water for Uncle Wesley to use in milking. I had to set down the pail to shut the gate so the chickens wouldn't get into the flower beds, and old Snap stuck his dirty nose into the water and began to lap it down. I knew Uncle Wesley wouldn't use that, so I had to go way back to the cistern for more, and it pumps awful hard. Made me mad, so I threw the water on Snap. Well, what of it? Nothing, if he'd stood still, but scared him awful, and when he's afraid he just goes a-humping for Aunt Margaret. 
When he got right up against her, he stiffened out and gave a big shake. You ought to seen the nice blue dress she had put on to go to Onabasha. Mrs. Comstock and Ammon laughed, but Elnora put her arms around the boy. Oh, Billy, she cried, that was too bad. She got up early and ironed that dress to wear because it was cool. Then, when it was all dirty, she wouldn't go when she wanted to real bad. Billy wiped his eyes. That ain't all, either, he added. We'd like to know about it, Billy, suggested Mrs. Comstock, struggling with her face. "'Cause she couldn't go to the city. She's most worked herself to death today. She's done all the dirty old hard jobs she could find. She's fixing her grape juice now. Sure, cried Mrs. Comstock. When a woman is disappointed, she always works like a dog to gain sympathy. While Uncle Wesley and I are sympathizing all we know how, without her working so, I've squeezed until I almost busted to get the juice out from the seeds and skins. That's the hard part. Now she has to strain it through white flannel and seal and bottles, and it's good for sick folks. Most wish I get sick myself so I could have a glass. It's so good. Elnora glanced swiftly at her mother. I've worked so hard, continued Billy, that she said if I could throw the leavings in the woods and I could come for you to see about the bugs. Do you want to go? We will all go, said Mrs. Comstock. I am mightily interested in those bugs myself. From afar, commotion could be seen at the Sinton home. Wesley and Margaret were running around wildly, and peculiar sounds filled the air. "'What's the trouble?' asked Gammon, hurrying to Wesley. "'Cholera,' groaned Senton. "'My hogs are dying like flies.' Margaret was softly crying. "'Wesley, can't I fix something hot? Can't we do anything? It means several hundred dollars in our winter meat.' "'I never saw stock taken so suddenly and so hard,' said Wesley. "'I have phoned for the veterinary to come as soon as he can get here.' All of them hurried to the feeding pen into which the pigs seemed to be gathering from the woods. Among the common stock were big, white beasts of pedigree, which were Wesley's pride at county fairs. Several of these rolled on their backs, pawing the air feebly and emitting little squeaks. A huge bookshire sat on his haunches, slowly shaking his head, the water dropping from his eyes until he, too, rolled over with faint grunts. A pair crossing the yard on wavering legs collided and attacked each other in anger, only to fall so weak they scarcely could squeal. A fine snowy Plymouth Rock rooster, after several attempts, flew to the fence, balanced with great effort, wildly flapped his wings and started to emit a guttural crow, but broke off and fell sprawling among the pigs, too helpless to stand. "'Did you ever see such a dreadful sight?' sobbed Margaret. Billy climbed on the fence, took one long look, and turned an astounded face to Wesley. "'Why, them pigs is drunk!' he cried. "'They act just like my pa!' Wesley turned on Margaret. "'Where did you put the leavings from that grape-juice?' he demanded. "'I sent Billy to throw it in the woods.' "'Billy?' began Wesley. "'Throw it just where she told me to,' cried Billy. "'But some of the pigs came by there coming into the pen, "'and some were close in the fence corners.' "'Did they eat it?' demanded Wesley. "'They just chanked into it,' replied Billy graphically. "'They pushed and squealed and fought over it. "'You couldn't blame them. "'It was the best stuff I ever tasted.' Faint squealing, punctuated by feeble crows, filled the long pause which ensued. Margaret, said Wesley, run, phone that doctor he won't be needed. Billy, take Elnora and Mr. Ammon to see the bugs. Catherine, suppose you help me a little. Wesley took the clothes basket from the back porch and started in the direction of the cellar. Margaret returned from the telephone. I just caught him, she said. There's that much saved. Why, Wesley, what are you going to do? "'You go sit on the front porch a little while,' said Wesley. "'You will feel better if you don't see this.' "'Wesley!' cried Margaret, aghast. "'Some of that wine is ten years old. "'There's days and days of hard work in it, "'and I couldn't say how much sugar. "'Dr. Ammon keeps people alive with it "'when nothing else will stay on their stomachs.' "'Let em die, then,' said Wesley. "'You heard the boy, didn't you?' "'It's a cold process. "'There's not a particle of fermentation about it.' "'Not a particle of fermentation. "'Great day, Margaret. "'Look at those pigs.' Margaret took a long look. "'Leave me a few bottles for mincemeat,' she wavered. "'Not a smell for any cause on this earth. You heard the boy. He shan't say when he grows to manhood that he learned to like it here.' Wesley made a clean sweep, Mrs. Comstock cheerfully assisting. Then they all went to the woods to see and learn about the wonderful insects. That day ended with a big supper at Sentence, and then they went down to the Comstock cabin for a concert. Elnora played beautifully that night. When the sentence left, she kissed Billy with particular tenderness. She was so moved that she was kinder to Ammon than she had intended to be, and Elnora, as an antidote to a disappointed lover, was a decided success in any mood. 
however strong the attractions of Edith Carr had been, once the bond was finally broken, Philip Ammon could not help realizing that Elnora was the superior woman, and that he was fortunate to have escaped just when he regarded his ties strongest. Every day while working with Elnora he saw more to admire. He grew very thankful that he was free to try to win her, and impatient to justify himself to her. Elnora did not evince the slightest haste to hear what he had to say, but waited the week she had set, in spite of Philip's hourly manifest impatience. When she did consent to listen, Philip realized before he had talked five minutes that she was putting herself in Edith Carr's place, and judging him from what the other girl's standpoint would be. That was so disconcerting, he did not plead his cause nearly so well as he had hoped, for when he ceased, Elnora sat in silence. "'You are my judge,' he said at last. "'What is your verdict?' "'If I could hear her speak from her heart, as I just have heard you, then I could decide,' answered Elnora. "'She is on the ocean,' said Philip. "'She went because she knew she was wholly in the wrong. She had nothing to say or she would have remained.' "'That sounds plausible,' reasoned Elnora. But it is pretty hard to find a woman in an affair that involves her heart with nothing at all to say. I fancy if I could meet her just now she would say several things. I should love to hear them. If I could talk with her three minutes, I could tell what answer to make you. Don't you believe me, Elnora? Unquestioningly, answered Elnora. But I would believe her also. If only I could meet her, I soon would know. I don't see how that is to be accomplished, said Ammon, but I am perfectly willing. There is no reason why you should not meet her, except that she probably would lose her temper and insult you. Not to any extent, said Elnora calmly. I have a tongue of my own, while I am not without some small sense of personal values. Emma glanced into her face and began to laugh. Very different of facial formation and coloring, Elnora at times closely resembled her mother. She joined in Emma's laugh a little ruefully. The point is this, she said. Someone is going to get hurt, most dreadfully. If the decision as to who it shall be rests with me, I must know it is the right one. Of course, no one ever hinted it to you, but you are a very attractive man, Philip. You are mighty good to look at, and you have a trained, refined mind that makes you most interesting. For years, Edith Carr has felt that you were hers. She has lived expecting to assume the closest relations of life with you. She has thought of you as hers, and you were hers. Now, how is she going to change? I've been thinking, thinking deep and long, Phil. If I were in her place, I simply could not give you up, unless you had made yourself unworthy of love. Undoubtedly, you never seemed so desirable to hers just now, when she is told she can't have you. What I think is that she will come to claim you yet. You overlook the fact that it's not in a woman's power to throw away a man and pick him up at leisure, said Ammon with some warmth. She publicly and repeatedly cast me off. I accepted her decision as publicly as it was made. You have done all your thinking from a wrong viewpoint. You seem to have an idea that lies with you to decide what I shall do, that if you say the word, I shall return to Edith. Get that thought out of your head. Now and for all time to come, she is a matter of indifference to me. She killed all feeling in my heart for her so completely that I do not even dread meeting her. I could see her coming down the walk now without the quickening of her heartbeat. I can meet her as casually as any woman I ever met and like least of all women. If I hated her or was angry with her, I could not be sure the feeling would not die. As it is, she has deadened me into a creature of indifference. So you just revise your viewpoint a little, Elnora. Cease thinking it is for you to decide what I shall do and that I will obey you. I make my own decisions in reference to any woman save you. The question you are to decide is whether I may remain here, associating with you as I did last summer, but with the difference that it is understood that I am free that it is my intention to care for you all I please, to make you return my feeling for you if I can. There is just one question for you to decide, and it is not triangular. It is between us. May I remain? May I love you? Will you give me the chance to prove what I think of you? You speak very plainly, said Elnora. This is the time to speak plainly, said Philip Ammon. There is no use in allowing you to go on threshing out a problem which does not exist. If you do not want me here, say so, and I will go. Of course, I warn you before I start that I will come back. I won't yield without the stiffest fight it is in me to make. I will have all you have to give any man if I can get it. But drop thinking it lies in your power to send me back to Edith Carr. If she were the last woman in the world and I the last man, I'd jump off the planet before I would give her further opportunity to exercise her temper on me. Narrow this to us, Elnora. Will you take the place she vacated? Will you take the heart she threw away? 
I'd give my right hand and not flinch if I could offer you my life, free from any contact with hers, but that is not possible. I can't undo things which are done. I can only profit by experience and build better in the future. I don't see how you can be sure of yourself, said Elnor. I don't see how I could be sure of you. You loved her first. You never can care for me anything like that. Always I'd have to be afraid you were thinking of her and regretting. Folly, cried Ammon. Regretting what? I was not married to a woman who was liable to rave at me any time or place without my being conscious of having given offense. A man does relish that. I'm likely to pine for more. You'd be thinking she learned a lesson. You would think it wouldn't happen again. No, I wouldn't be thinking, said Ammon. I'd be everlastingly sure. I won't risk what I went through that night again not to save my life. Just you and me, Elnora, decide for us. I can't, cried Elnora. I'm afraid. Very well, said Ammon. We will wait until you feel that you can. Wait until fear vanishes. Just decide now whether you would rather have me go for a few months or remain with you. Which shall it be, Elnora? You can never love me as you did her, wailed Elnora. I'm happy to say I cannot, replied Ammon. I've cut my matrimonial teeth. I'm cured of wanting to swell in society. I've gotten over being proud of a woman for her looks alone. I've no further use for lavishing myself on a beautiful, elegantly dressed creature who thinks only of self. I've come to the surface. I've learned that I'm just a common man. I admire beauty and beautiful clothing just as much as I ever did. But first, I want an understanding, deep as the lowest recess in my soul with the woman I marry. I want to work for you, to plan for you, to build you a home with every comfort, to give you all good things I can to shield you from every evil. I want to interpose my body between yours and fire, flood, or famine. I want to give you everything, but I hate the idea of getting nothing at all on which I can depend in return. Edith Carr had only good looks to offer, and when anger overtook her, beauty went out like a snuffed candle. I want you to love me. I want some consideration. I even crave respect. I've kept myself clean. So far as I know how to be, I am honest and scrupulous. It wouldn't hurt me to feel that you took some interest in these things. Pretty fierce temptations strike a man every few days in this world. I can keep decent for a woman who cares for decency, but when I do, I like to have the fact recognized by just enough of a show of appreciation that I could see it. I'm tired of this one-sided business. as made me selfish. After this, I want to get a little in return for what I give. Elnora, you have love, tenderness, and honest appreciation of the finest in life. Take what I offer, and give what I ask. You do not ask much, said Elnora. As for not loving you as I did Edith, continued Ammon, as I said before, I hope not. I have a newer and a better idea of loving. The feeling I offer you was inspired by you. It is a Limberlost product. It is as much bigger, cleaner, and more wholesome than any feeling I ever had for Edith Carr. As you are bigger than she, when you stand before your classes and in calm dignity explain the marvels of the Almighty, while she stands on a ballroom floor and gives way to uncontrolled temper, ye gods, Elnor, if you could look into my soul, you would see it leap and rejoice over my escape. Perhaps it isn't decent, but it's human, and I'm only a common human being. I'm the gladdest thing alive that I'm free. I would turn somersaults and yell if I dared. What an escape! Just snatch out of it with a clean conscience when I was most besotted. Stop straining after Edith Carr's viewpoint and take a look from mine. Put yourself in my place and try to study out how I feel. I am so happy I get religious over it. Fifty times a day I catch myself whispering, My soul has escaped. As for you, take all the time you want. If you had rather be alone, I'll take the next train and stay away as long as I can bear it. But I'll come back. You can be most sure of that. Straight as your pigeons to their loft, I'll come back to you, Elnora. Shall I go? Oh, what's the use to be extravagant, murmured Elnora. End of chapter 21